technology to the rescue. <laughs> Short-term fixes, in, of course, uh, include education and enforcement. Those we can implement uh, rather quickly and agilely, but the, the, the technology, the engineering, those, those things that, that will live on beyond the education and the enforcement, um, those we, we really depend upon. And so this idea that technology will, might come to the rescue, uh, we think was, a, was an excellent topic. To lead our panel of distinguished guests is Brian Veracruz. Brian has been a friend of the DuPage Railroad Safety Council for many years. He moved to the Illinois Commerce Commission from the Department of Transportation, uh, fortunately for us, because we get to work more closely with him in his role there. Brian is the Rail Safety Program Administrator with the Illinois Commerce Commission. He started with the ICC in 2000 and is responsible for managing the commission's inspection, rail safety education and outreach and crossing safety improvement programs. Brian, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for moderating this panel. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here today moderating this technology segment with our panelists. Before I introduce Bob to start us off, I owe everyone an update. In 2012, the theme of the summit was safety is good business, evolution is happening. I presented a timeline of technological advances associated with projects supported by the Illinois Commerce Commission dating back to 2002. Here are slides from that presentation where we envisioned four quadrant gates with vehicle detection that would provide health status directly to the train. In the event a vehicle was stuck on a crossing, as shown in the bottom left, or the warning devices were not operating correctly, the system using satellite and wayside communications would reduce the speed of the train. Here is another slide from the 2002 presentation showing the train braking parameters for the system. The Incremental Train Control System, ITCS, was originally developed by General Electric, now Alstom, in 1995. In Michigan, it was utilized to activate warning devices starting in the year 2000. The feature to include highway rail crossing health started development in 2010 as part of the Chicago to St. Louis project in Illinois. 11 years later, the system was placed in service with train speeds at 90 miles per hour. And now it is anticipated that speeds will be increased to 110 miles per hour by the end of this year. So I'm very happy to close the loop on this update. I can just say there are many factors in the development, adoption, or adaption of a technology. In addition to positive train control, which the ITCS system falls under, we have seen great advances in so many areas, including artificial intelligence, analytics, LIDAR, use of drones, and photogrammetry, to name just a few. And each of these we will hear about from our panelists. Our first panelist, Bob Koppenhaver, is a sales and marketing executive with 30 years experience in the controls and safety industries. Bob has worked for such companies as Rockwell Automation, Wind River, Honeywell, and Dragger Safety in executive leadership roles until joining the team at Denso Wave. In Denso Wave, Bob is responsible for all sales and marketing activities for the Edge product division. In this role, he helps companies deliver new and innovative products by applying advanced automotive technologies to new markets. One such example is a portfolio of LiDAR sensors used for safety and security applications and he is here today to present how LiDAR technology is being used to reduce injuries and deaths in railroad applications. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you for the introduction, Brian, and thank you all for being here. Today, I'd like to talk about a technology many of you use every day, in many cases without even knowing it, and how this technology can make our railroads safer and more secure. But first, just a little bit of background on how this technology came about. In the 1960s, the Japanese government became very concerned at the number of trespassing and deaths and injuries at crossings. To combat that, they initiated on a program to try and eliminate crossings, much like the discussion we had earlier today. So they, they attempted to go from a high number of railroad crossings using grade elimination programs, grade separation, down to a much, much more manageable number. So you can see on the picture on the left, what the crossings look like and some of the grade separations that they have they've accomplished in the past. 
So they went from 70,000 railroad crossings in Japan in the 1960s to 33,000 crossings in 2019. While this did have a large effect on reducing deaths and injuries, dropping from about 1,300 uh, deaths and injuries in 1991 to about uh, six, just over 600 in 2019, there was still a large number even after the grade separation program. So you can see, if you look at the pie chart on the right, that about 34% are at the crossings themselves and 57% uh, are resulting from accidents when someone enters the right of way other than at a crossing. And of course, this would include some trespassers or suicides. Stu presented some excellent data earlier showing railroad fatalities, fatalities over time. In the US, we too have embarked on railroad crossing elimination program, as was discussed, to help reduce injuries and deaths. So this too has been successful in reducing the overall number of deaths and injuries. We still have over 2,043 deaths in the US. 43% are occurring at crossings and 57% occur from trespassing. Unfortunately, it's not possible to have great separations at every crossing due to the complexity, cost, and geographical isolation. Other technology solutions need to be found to help reduce these deaths and injuries by monitoring the grade crossings and trespassers and then taking remedial action. One such te technology that's well suited for this is of course, LIDAR. Many of you already use LIDAR today. It's in your cars. It's actually in your phones in many cases to, to uh, understand distances. So our parent company, Denso, actually supplies LIDAR technology to a lot of the automobile manufacturers in the world. Typically, what, what you do is you, uh, you actually put the LIDAR technology in the front of the automobile. And the LIDAR, the way it works is it sends out a beam of light in a fan pattern to detect something that's in front of the car. So if you're driving too close to uh, something else in front of you, uh, if there's an object in the roadway, if there's a pedestrian that's walking out in front of you, this is able to identify that there's an object in your path and also the actual distance that object is away. The way this works is, of course, the, the LIDAR is actually sending out this beam of light and it's measuring the amount of time for that beam to come back after it bounces off that object. That's how it determines the actual distance from the car to the object in front of it. So the same technology has been repackaged from the automobile into standalone sensors. These sensors have been, have been deployed as standalone security devices that are able to monitor uh, large footprint areas in all weather conditions and during daytime and nighttime using the same LiDAR technology that's in your automobile. So this is the zone D sensor that we just had on the last picture. And this is sort of how it works from a, from a range perspective. LIDAR is, is of course dependent on light because it is a laser beam. So the amount of reflectivity that an object has in front of it will dictate how well it can see that object. So there's different ranges. Uh, you can have up to a minimum of 100 feet. And for, for that, it would be a very low reflectance level. A low reflectance level would typically be associated with somebody that is wearing black clothing at night. They're gonna be very low reflectance, but typically during the day and normal or, or uh, during the day or, or during well lit uh, areas like grog grade crossings in a lot of cases, we can see up to 200, two to 300 feet away from the actual sensor. Next slide. So, what we're seeing here is the way the actual fan pattern works that I talked about earlier. So the LIDAR is actually a single laser that is incremented on a servo and it pulses around this 190 degree pattern. So basically what we're showing here is we're pulsing every 0.25 degrees. So in essence, what that means is we're, we're doing that 190 degrees, basically 780 pulses. This is important because the number of pulses helps us to determine the actual size of the objects. We're doing all of this in 33 milliseconds. So 30 times a second, we're pulsing. So by doing this, we're able to determine, again, the distance, as we talked about before. We're able to determine the size because of the, the granularity of the pulses. So we can see the leading edge and the trailing edge. And we can also determine the direction and speed of travel because we're keeping track of where that object was previously 
and where it's actually going. Next. So also with certain laser sensors like the ones that we provide, we have additional functionality that uh, provides both hardware as well as software interfaces. So we have built-in relays to drive such things as warning indicator lights, audible alarms. We can also use inputs from the field to help us drive a response. We can also pass the location coordinates directly to a camera, particularly like a Pantel zoom camera. And then this camera can actually track a trespasser or an individual as they move through the coverage area. Using the built-in ethernet, we can also pass this information onto a remote security or monitoring center. The capabilities of the software also have the ability to define up to six different zones. So this can be designed in a free form capability by the user and the, and the configuration allows the system to only alarm when a certain object is one of the zones and ignore smaller objects like animals. So look at this illustration. Zone one, you might, uh, you might have a warning indicator. Zone two, you might have a light and alarm that goes off. Zone three, you might have warning bells and uh, we might be dispatching a security personnel to the actual site. Next slide. So this is used today in a lot of uh, different uh, areas like utilities. So here you can see how it works uh, using large footprints or using the LIDAR and the camera together. Next, we can see how it's also used in places like airports. So this is again used, uh, it's selected for airports because it's weather resistant. So we can see in fog and snow and rain and, and all other weather patterns. And of course, next slide shows that we actually are using this technology in Japan at the railroad crossings as well. In this case, we're constantly monitoring the crossing using our LIDAR sensor. And then what happens is when we get a signal, the gates are closed, we then arm the actual LIDAR sensor. If we determine a car or person, depending on how the system is configured, it's in the grade crossing, we can then take action that it can include a warning indicator to, or alarm to the driver of the automobile, as shown on the right. Uh, we could also send a visual alarm to the oncoming train. Uh, we can also tie directly into the uh, potential, the train system itself, because we have Ethernet built into our system. So if we look at how it might be configured on a railroad crossing today, this is just one example. This has, uh, you have the ability to design this the way that you would like. Uh, we would have warning indicators that maybe would be in the case of a grade crossing if someone's getting a little bit too close to the actual gate. Maybe we just have some sort of a warning indicator. You could have a trespasser a potential that's going down the right of way. So we can define a zone that actually monitors that and we can send a message to the security center. We can also be monitoring lanes one and lane two, and using this, we can actually open an exit gate when necessary in the case where there's a stranded vehicle. So there's a lot of flexibility built into the system uh, to do whatever you need to accomplish in order to make your grade crossings and your right of way safer. Next slide. So this is just showing some examples of how this has been, has been deployed in Japan. So you can see that uh, this is set up uh, diagonally across the tracks. And on the right-hand side, you can see the laser sensors. These are two laser sensors mounted. Uh, one was, the top one is monitoring the cars and the bottom one is, is monitoring pedestrians because we have a, an issue with falling pedestrians in Japan. Uh, next slide just shows the same view. And then the next slide also shows some of the other capabilities. So. Uh, using this, we can actually uh, not just look at the grade crossing itself, but we can look at the right of way. So if you click on the transitions, we can set up our LIDAR sensors so that they actually monitor in between the grade crossing areas as well. So this is monitoring trespassers as they enter from the grade crossing going into the railroad right of way. And if you look to the next slide, you can also see that we could monitor uh, trespassers or potential suicide uh, attempts in, in, su in suspect areas by uh, deploying the laser sensor within the actual right of way as opposed to just at the grade crossings. So uh, lastly, uh, there's another area that we've just started working on. So this is for platform safety. In this case, this has been deployed uh, to monitor the actual platforms. We have these flexible gates that can come down 
We're using our LiDAR sensor in the upper right-hand corner to monitor the yellow line if anybody crosses over it. We use the LiDAR sensor on the other side of the gate to actually monitor it to make sure no one is trapped um, next to the train when it takes off. And the LiDAR at the bottom is actually measuring to make sure that nobody enters the platform area when there's no train uh, that's there. And next slide. So this has been deployed in Japan at a number of railroads, uh, been adopted by Kintetsu and JR Central. And uh, it also has seven more that it's under consideration. And lastly, I just wanted to share, we also had uh, some analysis done by Kintetsu Railroad. And uh, there is a detailed report that's available, but basically our zone D sensor was three times more accurate than their existing photoelectric devices. And that's why they're adopting our LIDAR sensor for railroad crossings. So with that, I'd like to uh, just finish up and thank you so much for your time and attention. All right, thank you so much, Bob, for sharing your experience and innovation with LIDAR and your studies and work in Japan. Now to our second panelist, Kevin Stuhler. Officer Stuhler has served with Metro's Police Department since 2017. Kevin will discuss Metro's drone program and its utilization for surveys, including post-crash investigations. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you very much for your time. Um, well, I'm Officer Steele at the Metro Police Department. I'll be talking about our unmanned aerial system operations program. So a little bit about the Metro Police Department, um, Metro in general, um, for those that don't know, it is the state of Illinois Railroad Commuter Transit Division that falls under the Regional Transportation Authority. Um, the police department itself has complete jurisdiction within our six counties. So our six counties, uh, as you can see on the next slide, um, you can see our 11 rail lines that go through all the different villages. Um, throughout these 11 lines, we have 242 stations, 566 uh, grade crossings, and over a um, thousand miles of track. So with that being said, um, unfortunately, we have the potential of over a thousand miles of problems that could occur, ranging from trespassing, uh, people driving around down gates, um, and people wishing to take their own lives. Um, when these types of incidents occur, uh, this is where our drone, uh, drone program comes into play. So a little bit of an overview. Since 2019, um, we've had over 170 uh, mission deployments with our drones. These include train strikes, um, assisting other agencies, search and rescue, as well as crime scene documentation being the big one. We've had 207 uh, train deployments, and at the moment we have uh, two FAA Part 107 licensed operators. So the Federal Aviation Administration uh, requires any individual operating a drone at a commercial capacity uh, to become a licensed operator. And uh, we have 24 hours of instructor-led training with uh, PIX4D photogrammetry software, which I'll dive into a little bit more later. Next slide. So we are currently using a uh, unique H520 model drone, as well as a DJI Maverick 2 Enterprise Advanced and a uh, Maverick 3 Cinema drone. Next slide. So what is photogrammetry? Uh, photogrammetry is the art of obtaining reliable information about physical objects through uh, recording, measuring, and interpreting images. Um, it's used for surveying and mapping in order to measure distances between any objects. So the image you see on the right, uh, one through six, is kind of how we would um, fly our drone over uh, railroad tracks, for example, overlapping series of photographs and then we would actually uh, fly the drone backwards coming towards us, overlapping with the original photos, keep overlapping. And then we would, um, for the diagram just slightly above it, go up no more at 50, 60 feet uh, and create a triangulation of uh, photographs. And that in turn will help us get uh, accurate measurements and recreate um, images. Next slide. So with photogrammetry software, such as uh, PIX4D uh, that we currently use, uh, the PIX4D software will take the overlapping images captured by a drone and stitch them together. Thus, like I said, creating a 3D image or a bird's eye view scene. We'll use this for evidence marking, um, determining points of impact, final places of rest, if an object is uh, thrown, uh, and 3D imaging um, of damage. So damage done to vehicles, trains, buildings. Um, from there, we can uh, determine 
like crumple zone distances and everything. And most importantly, uh, the dis measuring distances between any objects. If you could actually go back to the slide. So uh, in the images, the floating green diagrams would be our uh, photographs that we took that were overlapping. All at once all stitched together, the other images of the bridge and of the uh, black vehicle there um, would be your final product. All right, uh, next slide. So here's an example of an individual that drove around uh, down railroad gates. Uh, next slide. So in 2020 in Arlington Heights, Illinois, we had a uh, train versus vehicle incident. Um, the incident spanned um, 1,550 feet. Uh, with our drones, we took uh, 271 images as well as uh, video footage. Um, video footage we usually capture just uh, is the direction of travel of the train. And we try to obtain a 360 degree imagery of the, uh, the actual scene itself. Um, the approximate flight time with our drone was uh, 25 minutes. Next slide. And our UAS mission was uh, completed prior to the arrival of the medical examiner, as well as the tow truck. Um, an alternative to accident reconstruction using drones would be with a total station. Um, there was a survey that was taken by the uh, Lake County Major Crash Assistance Team that stated that it would take about two hours to complete a scene. So that is approximately two hours of shutting down a grade crossing, uh, stopping over railroad traffic, and shutting down roads versus 25 to 30 minutes worth of work with a drone, um, and then we can get trains moving. Um, this scene was later recreated with the uh, Pix4D software. Uh, we use Pix4D as well as a conjunction software called Map Tools. Uh, next slide. So here's an example of that scene in Arlington Heights on a uh, Google Maps overlay. The red lines you see are uh, areas that we marked up. Um, and each line will give us accurate measurements. Um, from there, we can also drop pins and do uh, additional measurements. Here's an additional uh, marked up area with some labels, the incident. Next slide. Another grade crossing that was marked up. We could tell the distances between the actual stop lines, uh, point of impact, tire marks, uh, scrape marks and whatnot. Next slide. As well as here's an image that looks like it's on file, paper and pencil. Same type of imagery, just in a different point of view. Next slide. Uh, this was the, just an image of the scene that took place. Um, so we can also provide just still images as well for evidence documentation. Next slide. So this was from a scene in uh, LaGrange, Illinois, of a uh, trespasser that was um, unfortunately struck by one of our trains. Uh, next slide. So if we are unable to obtain any type of um, video footage for evidence, crime scene documentation, our uh, Pix4D software will allow us to create an animated video. Um, in this animated video, you can see where the green lines and orange mark, green and orange markers as uh, points of interest, things that we've marked up. Um, and we can also always go back to and get additional measurements if need be. Can actually skip to the next slide. So, suicide by train. Uh, the Metro Police Department receives a number of calls throughout the year of individuals that state that they wish to take their own life. Um, or we will receive calls from family, friends, stating that a loved one has uh, made a comment of committing suicide by way of train. When these types of incidents occur, officers will respond to the area where they um, where an attempt will be made to uh, look for that individual, as well as our uh, dispatching center through uh, Cook County Sheriff's Department will make an attempt to uh, ping the caller's cell phone that wishes to take their own life. That's possible. With the use of drones, we've had the ability to search our property in the hopes of locating these individuals and uh, getting them the help they need. Uh, drones are a great tool to utilize in uh, hard to reach areas or where a vehicle cannot gain access or an officer may struggle to reach um, more, you know, railroad property that's adjacent to marshland and whatnot. So, the Freedom of Drone Surveillance Act uh, 
allows us to use drones in a particular manner. Um, if a law enforcement agency possesses reasonable suspicion that under particular circumstances, swift action is needed to prevent immediate harm to life, or if a law enforcement agency is attempting to locate a missing person and is not also undertaking a criminal investigation. So it was the main topic of this um, presentation of preventing tragedy on the tracks. You know, if we can prevent people from committing suicide and getting them the help they need, that's our number one goal. So trespassing, um, going back to the uh, drone, Freedom from Drone Surveillance Act. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, it prohibits law enforcement officers from using drones to gather information. Meaning that if we have an issue with trespassers in an area, um, I can't pre-deploy a drone to conduct surveillance. Even if it's on our property, um, a warrant is required. Um, but the exemption to that is if a law enforcement agency possesses reasonable suspicion that under particular circumstances, um, swift action is needed to prevent immediate harm to life or for um, first of all, the immediate escape of a suspect or the destruction of evidence, um, a drone can be deployed uh, once the crime of trespassing to railroad property or state supported land has occurred. Uh, trespassing in rail yards or across non-designated crossings is dangerous and from time and time again, it's proven to be deadly. If someone is trespassing, they, um, they're not free to leave. Uh, a citation or arrest could be warranted. And then just below are the uh, two different statutes for the state of Illinois that we follow for uh, trespassing. Next slide. So one way the Metro Police Department has been able to prevent trespassing and help reduce the risk of train versus pedestrian strikes is by the use of our uh, photokite. Photokite is a uh, tethered kite that is used for situational awareness and can go up to 150 feet and stay up in the air as long as it has a power source. Um, the current one that we have is attached to a command van unit. This unit has the ability to have a thermal camera as well as standard camera capabilities. Um, and while the Federal Aviation Administration has created laws for tethered drones, it doesn't meet the standards to be a drone um, entirely. So the part 107 rules and laws and regulations don't 100% um, apply to this type of model. Um, one location that we predominantly use our photokite is our Metro Electric line, which um, those who are familiar with the area by uh, the McCormick Place busway. This is an area between uh, Michigan Avenue and Grand Park in the city of Chicago. Uh, throughout the year, the city of Chicago hosts events such as Lollapalooza, and coming next year, NASCAR. Um, the city utilizes the bridge that the bridges that cross over our train tracks as access points for people attending these events. However, um, from year to year, time and time again, people that try to sneak into these events will jump down from the ground level and cross our tracks. Uh, this is a very busy area that has constant train traffic uh, going to and from our Millennium and Van Buren train station. As well as these tracks are also utilized by uh, Nick D. South Shore uh, trains from Indiana. So, if we um, visually see somebody, one of our camera systems or whatnot, um, we'll put up the drone, we'll track the person trespassing on the property, um, we'll notify patrol units to go apprehend that individual, um, whether it be they issue a citation or uh, escort off the property. But our main goal is to. Uh, prevent a uh, pedestrian strike by way of train. And that uh, concludes my presentation. All right, thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, the development and use of unmanned aerial systems have always been a great area of interest in relation to rail safety. And I know particular, particularly to Dr. Wilson and the DuPage Rail Safety Council, same with the commission, we're looking forward to greater use. But thank you for sharing your experience and leadership with Metro's drone program. Our final panelists, Barry Carta, Chris Markison, and Connor Polomsky are the co-founders of Croy Railway Group. Uh, they are here to discuss independent data collection and predictive analytic tools that Croy has developed to provide train location data for communities, first responders, and commuters. Uh, go ahead, gentlemen, thank you. Thanks so much for that introduction, Brian. Uh, we greatly appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel today. And uh, we're really excited to be talking with you all about CROI. I'll start off by introducing myself. Uh, I'm Chris Markison, and I'm a freshman at the University of Iowa. 
Uh, and one of the co-founders of CROI. My name is Barry Carta. I'm a sophomore at the University of Utah. I'm one of the other co-founders. My name is Connor Blomsky. I'm a sophomore at DePaul University, and I'm also a co-founder of CROI. So we're really excited to be speaking today. So on to the next slide. For the presentation, we'll be talking about issues, highway rail crossings, and the railroad right away close to municipalities. Then we'll explain how our technology is able to solve these issues. In addition to other safety features we are developing to help with trespasser prevention, suicide prevention, and unsafe rail condition detection. But first, Chris will give you a little bit of an overview about how our mission came to be. Thanks, Connor. Uh, so our story starts in 2019 in a high school class at York High School in Elmhurst, Illinois. Uh, and that class tasked us with finding a problem and coming up with a marketable solution as a group. Uh, being in Elmhurst, you can see in the satellite image on the slide uh, that we are directly west of the Proviso Rail Yard, one of the largest rail yards in all of Illinois. Because of this, we'd all experience being in a hurry in our cars and being stopped at a grade crossing by a train for up to 15 minutes. We wanted to do something to fix this problem of commuter traffic. And uh, in, the research of, in the research and development of our solution, we came across two even bigger issues that we thought needed a fix in addition to just commuter traffic. Those two issues were train blockages causing delays to first responders and trespassing on railroad tracks and suicide. We officially filed as an LLC in July of 2020, and we have made great progress since then. We have rarely been in attendance of DRSC meetings, learning all about railroad safety and what we can do to help find a solution. The DRSC also graciously awarded us a $5,000 grant in order to support further de development of our technology that will help prevent deaths and injuries on railroads. We are so grateful for all that the DRSC has helped us with so far and look forward to all we will accomplish together in the future. Thank you for that background, Chris. Uh, like he mentioned, we had two main targets when developing the system. Uh, we wanted to help first responders and the delays that they faced when they were coming across a train, uh, as well as that commuter safety side, um, trespassers, suicide prevention. So knowing what we wanted to accomplish, we set two main goals for our data. Uh, we wanted our data to be able to map blockages 10 plus minutes in advance. Uh, so this means that 10 minutes before a train ever got there, we wanted to know the train would be there and at what time. And we wanted to be able to map expected clearing times of those same crossings. So once that train hits the crossing, how long is it going to be there? And when is it going to be clear? I'm sure you can all imagine a thousand different uses uh, for this kind of data. But like I said, again, we're mainly focusing on how this would affect first responders when responding to an emergency as well as traffic and congestion around those crossings when trains are there. So we're gonna take a look at this video in just a second. I want you to notice two things when you play this video. Uh, first thing is that every frame of the video is about a minute. So every image that you see is a minute in between. Um, and then the second is that you'll see two blockages occur in this video. Just to the left of the frame is one of the crossings in Elmer, Illinois at the quarry. You'll first see a 10 minute plus blockage uh, you'll notice cars back up off the back of the screen. That'll happen within the first two seconds of the video. And then just a second or two after that, you'll notice a second blockage. This one a little bit longer at right around 15 minutes long, uh, where cars again back off to the back of the screen. So let's go ahead and just play the first 10 minutes or 10 seconds of this video, please. You'll notice the first blockage. And you'll notice the second blockage. Great, we can pause the video. Both of those blockages occurred within the same hour at the same cross. So out of that one hour, about 40% of the time that blockage was completely, completely covered by that train. Not only was that one blockage affecting that one intersection, but you notice the traffic buildup was so rapid that very quickly multiple intersections became involved um, in this blockage. So we wanted to figure out first, how effective would this data be if it was in the hands of some first responders? So if you can go on to the next slide, please. So that's exactly what we did. Uh, we took a look at how it would affect fire departments in particular when provided with this data. So I'll start by running through this video on the left. We'll wait just a second before playing it. Um, this video is from one of the third parties we use to provide data to first responders. It's a company called Flow MSP. Some of you might be familiar with them, especially any um, village associates or presidents or anything. 
like that, but they do pre-planning services for fire departments. Um, and what this is that you're seeing on the screen is what the first responders see in the actual cab of the fire truck. So this comes up on their smart device with whatever ticket they have for whatever alarm there is. They'll click on their ticket, they'll open it up, they'll see relevant information and how to dispatch that emergency. So let's go ahead and play the video and you'll see this all happen. Oh, you might have to click on the actual video. Okay, it doesn't look like the video is playing. That's all right. If we can just go back to the last slide then. Yeah, you'll see one of the previous alerts that we had. Um, so what you would have seen in the video is train information such as this. This is actually real blockage data generated from our West Chicago unit. Um, this is just the arrival section. Uh, once the train first hits our sensor, we'll generate a piece of data like this. Um, if anyone's familiar with West Chicago, you know the Ann Street, Church Street, Washington Street, and Hawthorne Crossings. It provides timestamps at the actual um, time of expected blockage. So you'll notice expected arrival times. And then a second alert is sent with expected clearing times once that information becomes available. What you would have seen in the video is this information being actually included directly into their dispatch software. Um, there's three, you can go to the next slide again, sorry. There's three notable features about what we do. Everything's in real time when it goes to this backend system, whatever that system might be. Um, it goes over the first net first responder mobile network. So we have one access to one of the most secure mobile networks in the country for sending data. And you'll also notice that can be used for dynamic dispatch applications. So once the data is in the hand of those third parties, such as Flow, they can build it directly into their dispatching software, their routing software. Uh, so it gets to the point where it doesn't even have to be visually processed by the fire departments. Uh, it's automatically included in the routing information and it will directly route them around whatever the blockage is, as well as any traffic that's built up. Can you go to the next slide. Uh, all right. So uh, could you go ahead and uh, mute the volume on the video and uh, play it? And can you start it at uh, around 30? This is the core. And then uh, play it for about nine seconds until 39 seconds. Uh, so what you're seeing in this video is our trespass detection system. Uh, at first, it's just detecting uh, a tr that there's a train on the tracks and you can see a box around the train and it labels it as a train, uh, making sure that the AI is sure that it is in fact the train. Uh, it also shows the percentage that uh, the AI is sure that it is a train, so it says uh, in the top left corner, right by that box that labels it as a train. And then uh, I believe you saw a person walk out in front of the sensor and it shows a box around them with a label that says that it is, it is a person. It also uh, shows the percentage that it is sure that it is in fact a person. Uh, this technology can even be used to detect things such as animals, cars, tree branches, or other, other objects that could block the way of the railroad. Uh, we believe that this is uh, this will be a revolutionary tool in the world of railway safety, and uh, Connor will talk about in the next slide how we can relay this, relay this information uh, about a trespasser or obstruction of a railroad uh, to the people who can help mitigate the problem. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So, building off of the video we just looked at, um, we've developed mock alerts for iPhone and Android. So, if you look below, there is a trespasser alert a potential suicide alert, and an unsafe rail condition alert. So these are three prime examples of what our technology can do, but in no way is it limited to these types of alerts. A big decision that we made when developing this was to develop our own API, which means that we can build these alerts into any type of existing alert system. In addition to that, the alerts are customizable on what the user wants to see, um, whether that's the name of the alert, um, how to interact with the alert, or even like a image or a video that goes along with alert. So with the combination of real-time data that Barry mentioned and the ease of implementation, we envision this to have a substantial role in how monitoring, uh, remote monitoring will assist, assist safety personnel. So on to the next slide, um, share a little bit about the sensors that make this possible. We have two versions of the sensor, both of which have the same installation requirements. However, they have different uses. Version two on the right is a sensor that is used for predictive analytics. And version one on the left is a sensor that is used for the safety features. So while both units have the same process for gathering and sharing data, the main difference is that version one has a camera. 
This camera is what makes all the safety features possible. Our software team has trained the sensor with the camera um, from a library of 10,000 plus images, specifically on images um, that could be seen on the track. So our program is able to identify people and children at risk on the track and assign it to a degree of certainty. The way we envision this is that the user can set different thresholds of certainty. And once this threshold is reached, an alert will be sent out. Additionally, the software is always learning. And with more and more sensors deployed as we scale, we believe that we'll be able to recognize patterns in different hotspots that could warn of suicide and trespassing. So now Chris will talk a little bit more about the installation requirements that I just mentioned. Uh, so as Connor explained, we offer two sensors based on one's needs. Pictured on this slide is an example of our dual LiDAR sensor, uh, which uh, operates using predictive analytics. Uh, this particular sensor is mounted in West Chicago, Illinois, uh, and right along, right along their row, their uh, north-south railroad that goes through West Chicago. And uh, in terms of installment of our sensors, we have a short list of requirements that we need in order for our sensors to function properly. First of all, we need a direct line of sight to the tracks and the sensor can be no more than 50 meters away from the given track. We also need access to power on the installation site. And finally, we need either an already existing pole to attach our sensor to, or we have the option of installing our own pole that can serve the same purpose. Now Barry's gonna give you some insight into our future steps. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so we've already established that we have useful data and very compelling use cases uh, for this data. However, with any new technology, there's going to be the issue of adoption, um, and that's noticeable with our technology as well. So our first main goal is to scale the services that we already provide, such as the predictive analytics network. There's two big benefits to this. Um, with our technology and our data collection system, it works the best the more units we have out there. So the more units we get out, the further in advance we'll be able to provide alerts uh, and the more accurate these alerts will become. Uh, eventually with full coverage across all systems, what we'll essentially have is a real time map of all train locations and the ability to map out every blockage before it happens. Once we do this, we're gonna move on to testing out our trespassing system along the same network, um, deploying that, that camera LiDAR combination sensor, putting those in hot spots and seeing how effective those would be at providing those real-time alerts and you know, mitigating those trespass and suicide issues. Uh, eventually, we hope to build out into other third-party systems. I mentioned we already work with Flow MSP. Um, we built our own backend API, so it's very easy, us, very easy for us to plug and play with pretty much any other current system that the town uses. Um, and then eventually, maybe we might build our own CAD system or commuter-based tools uh, to go out beyond just first responders and the immediate safety concern. Um, so eventually your entire community can have access to this information effectively route around blockages. All right, thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, all the presentations. Thank you gentlemen for giving us uh, all of your work from Croy. And I'd like to take this time to thank all of our panelists for sharing their innovations and use of technology. And we have our question and answer segment now, and thank you to everyone. Uh, we have a number of um, areas that we'll, we'll lead into next. And if everybody wants to take a look at the Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom, we have open comments or questions, and then we also have answered. So I see that Officer Stuhler has been answering questions as we go, and we'll try to do that for some more for those that we uh, may not address in the time we have allotted. So with that, I think I'll go um, by each of our panelists and I'll start back with Bob. Uh, there's quite a few questions in terms of the studies and what Japan had, how long have they had the um, LIDAR sensors and their use of four quadrant gates. Can you give us a little bit of a background on their studies, use of four quadrant gates, and how long that they've been using the system that you showed us? Yeah, to be honest, I'm not sure how long the four quadrant gates have been in effect in Japan. It's been quite some time. The actual LIDAR sensor and, and doing the grade crossing sensors that we've been doing 
Uh, we started using our first security sensor for grade crossings, and then we modified it and came up with a second one that was designed specifically for grade crossings. And that's been out for about three years. Uh, this one has things like redundant processors as final resolution. It also has uh, what's called pole detection technology that allows us to see black vehicles, which is one of the downfalls for LiDAR technology. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And in the slides, I think it was identified that uh, the LiDAR system could communicate to the trains in Japan. Can you expand upon that? Yeah, it, it does not at this time communicate to the trains directly. Uh, uh, this is on our roadmap, uh, but what we have, what I wanted to say during the presentation was we have the capabilities built in. So since we have the ethernet capabilities and because we build both the hardware and the software for the LiDAR sensor, we have the ability to incorporate anybody's API into our LiDAR device. And then using the ethernet that's built into the system, we can also communicate directly to the, the train systems. We also have uh, with some of the uh, sites that we're, we're installing, we also have the ability to convert that over to wireless technology. So now we can actually communicate wirelessly to uh, a train potentially if, if that's a, a desire. We're, we're not quite there, but that is on our roadmap. Excellent. Thank you. When I brought up the incremental train control system earlier and what we've used in Illinois, you know, that system is all part of, you know, these are inputs from our inductance loops that serve as the detection similar mm -hmm. to the LIDAR system and then the health monitoring of gates. You know, those are the items that then those health outputs are communicated back to the overall system to help with, um, uh, either slowing or stopping a train. And that would be similar for, for your LiDAR system. Sure. The, the one big difference between the induction loop systems and the LiDAR system is with LiDAR, we can monitor, we can see if it's a car, if we can see if it's an animal, we can see if it's a person. With an induction loop system, you only can determine something that is a lot of metal. So they're going to not they're going to be you're going to be able to notify that there's a car on the tracks, but you won't be able to notify that there's a trespasser on the tracks. Exactly. Thank you for discussing the differences in the technologies. It's a good point. So I'll be back to you in a minute, but I want to make sure we get through everybody. So I'll uh, shift back to Kevin. If everybody takes a look in the answer sections, he's been very busy. Thank you very much for answering the questions. Um, I'm going to start with the one that was kind of interesting to me because when my son flew the drone at our house and then put his speaker on and yelled at me, I realized that we do have speaker capability, but can you go through what your answer was and how that impacts Metro and the police force? Uh, so yeah, in regards to uh, having a speaker on a drone and talking to trespassers, um, currently one of our model drones, our uh, DJI Mavic 2 Enterprise Advanced model does have a speaker. Um, certain brands of drones, they do have speaker attachments, whether it be um, made by the primary maker or an aftermarket part. Um, but a lot of them though, like the one that we have, we can speak to a trespasser and we can give them commands let them know hey you're trespassing get off the train tracks you know a, a train could be coming um except if they try talking back to the drone we have no way of hearing them right, thank you and then just as a protocol for metro police is the drone technology deployed for all metro related train accidents yes yeah, so anytime a uh, a train accident occurs um We'll always have officers arriving on scene first, um, mark up the scene, spray paint uh, points of interest and whatnot. So if we have a drone officer working, uh, we'll have them respond to the scene, um, take photographs of everything that's there. Um, sometimes our scenes, if we don't have a drone officer working are delayed, but we, at least we can go back and we know what each one of those spray paint markings are. Um, and then we can still go back and get uh, measurements and whatnot from there. Excellent. And I know you said that in terms of the ability to measure or process the scene is so much quicker than it used to be. There was a question about the role of the coroner and medical examiners. Has the use of drones expedited um, what they do when they have to come and release a scene? So at times it actually has for us um, pre-taking uh, photographs. Um, what, what we do is or towards the end of uh, wrapping up the scene, we'll uh, download all of our photographs on a, a software called Axon Evidence. 
Um, and then from there, if the coroner's office requests any photographs that we took, we can send them a uh, direct secure link with all those images. So just um, if we're already taking photographs, they'll just be like, oh, can I just get what you get? I don't need to take any. And that could save 10, 15 minutes potentially or however long it takes of uh, images that they would normally take. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. We'll be back to you then too, but I want to give a little opportunity to Chris and Connor and Barry. Um, there was a question in terms of the accuracy of the system at West Street in Elmhurst. I think you identified it as your West Chicago location. Um, how accurate it is, is it in identifying trespassers and do you have false positives was the question. Yeah, so the system, the West Chicago system we're referring to is the permanent installation of the dual LIDAR system in West Chicago, the town. So that system is a predictive analytics system. It doesn't do any of the trespasser detection, um, but the trespasser detection uh, camera LIDAR unit that we use out of the testing that we've done, where we've left it up along the CN line by York High School. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but there's a single track CN line that runs directly next to our local high school. Uh, we installed one of the LIDAR camera units there. Um, and I would sit in class every morning and watch students walk to school on my phone or on my laptop. And we never had any false positives when identifying people in that setting. Um, false positives usually don't come from the common objects. Uh, like I said, the system's constantly learning and being trained off the internet and off the video it collects. Uh, so common objects like cars, trains, people, if you saw in the video, those are usually 98 plus percent accurate um, in identifying them and labeling them. So. Excellent. Thank you. And then for all of the group, as you're pursuing your degrees at your universities, what technologies are you looking at and how does it impact what you've been working on with CROI? For me personally, uh, it's been about filling a lot of the technical gaps that exist in between, you know, developing a professional technology as a high school student and developing a professional technology as a professional. Um, so I've been taking computer science classes and, and other sorts of that, um, but it, it's mainly been filling in the tech gaps in, in my own knowledge. So. Excellent. Connor, how about for you? Uh, yeah, it's the same for me. I'm an economics major, so I, like, I'm doing a lot of economic classes, but I'm also starting to take computer science classes, so kind of lowering the, or the, the technological gap, and that's been helpful so far. That's excellent. Chris? Uh, yeah, so I'm still a freshman, so I have not had the chance to take any computer science classes, but I am taking a uh, analytical class, which has been really helpful with analyzing all of our data that we collect from both types of sensors, from both the predictive analytics sensor and the trespassing sensor. Excellent. Sounds good. So, so to jump back to Bob with the, the opposite spectrum with all of your time at Denzo Wave and what you see. Are there other technologies within the Denso line? Is there something else that you can share that excites you or might be used in the RAL application similar to the LIDAR units or adoption, adaption? Uh, we've, we've looked at things like millimeter wave technology also uh, because we also deploy that on the automobiles. Uh, but uh, we really focused on the LIDAR because of the granularity and, and the, the resolution that we could provide. Uh, there are other things that I can't talk about, <laughs> so I apologize for that, but there are other things that we're looking at, uh, spe specifically around trespasser and uh, gray crossing technology uh, that's going to be pretty exciting in the future as well. I think it's nice to just know it's on the horizon. I, I didn't mean to put you in a difficult <laughs> spot there, so I do understand. Uh, there were a couple of questions with the four quadrant gates, and I know as far as Japan and how long they've uh, utilize them. Has Japan had studies on their effectiveness that you're aware of? Uh, the four quadrant gates or the LIDAR systems? The four quadrant gates. That was kind of a, a multiple question. Yeah, that that I do not know. Now, on the LIDAR systems, there were a number of railroads that actually monitored, and, and I talked about that briefly at the very end. Mm -hmm. There was both Kintetsu and Nishi Nippon Railroad both did reports as well as the equivalent to the FRA did reports on our LiDAR sensor inside of Japan. And uh, again, very, very favorable. Uh, we have well over 100 installations in Japan for the actual gray crossing sensor. 
and we have over a thousand installations for the actual uh, security sensor. In this country, what we're doing is we're, we're focusing on both of those technologies. So we have the security with a camera sensor that's being used for trespasser uh, at one of our installation sites uh, that we're in the, in the process of deploying. And then we also are looking at the grade crossing technology for another site that we're actually actively employing. I know there was another question about uh, just the maturity level and, and things of that nature. So just getting on with that. So we've we've talked a little bit about you know some of the sites that we're doing already. And I just also wanted to let it be known that we're looking for additional potential uh, beta sites. Uh, we're in the process of going through the whole FRA uh, approval process. And so for that, we need a couple of sites that we want to do to do product safety plans with. So we're looking for railroads that might be interested in working with us and uh, be very interested in uh, meeting with those people. Excellent. Thank you, Bob. Uh, you know, for the general question that was asked with four quadrant gates analysis of effectiveness, uh, Steve Laffey from our Illinois Commerce Commission, you know, for our over 200 locations, we've been very fortunate that, you know, we haven't had accidents, you know, at the four quadrant gate locations. Uh, over 20, about 25% of incidents happen in Illinois with vehicles going around the gates. So, um, you know, we're very happy that those have been minimized at all of those locations. Uh, to jump back <clears throat> to Officer Stuhler, when we discussed the photogrammetry, and then we've also talked about LIDAR and what it has with the points and everything else. Uh, Kevin, can you give us a sense of the accuracy and all of the information that's provided to you compared to what you used to do? So um, compared to the sense of accuracy, so what we do is um, what's commonly called a scale constraint. What we'll use is these disks and we'll take an exact measurement between each center of each disk. So we know, for example, from here to here is exactly 50 feet. So once we put all of our pictures on the computer software and it stitches it all together and I drop a pin on one of those disks and then another one and it tells me that there's, you know, um, four nine and a half feet well okay i know that there is you know six inches of inaccuracy and we're able to accommodate for those uh, levels of inaccuracy and know what the difference is yeah excellent thank you yeah um we are looking at doing a survey of all ten thousand highway rail crossings in the state of illinois using photogrammetry and possibly lidar and it is amazing the amount of data that you can obtain um, with the controls that you set where you're, you're at a half an inch. And this becomes specifically important when we're talking about trucks being stuck on crossings or you know, just making sure that we have the appropriate measurements. So thank you, that is uh, incredible. Um, I think there was a few other questions as far as the photo kite and tethered. Um, <clears throat> can you give a little bit more information on the photo kite and does that create any issues similar to the warrant issues that you have with the uh, the drones when they're utilized? So with the photo kite, um, the way it's designed, you don't have to have a Part 107 FAA license. Um, it's a little bit more user friendly for just your average individual operating it. Um, However, there are still rules and regulations that you do have to follow via um, federal law or state law. Um, like with the photo kite is, like I mentioned, is um, attached to our command van. Um, if we see somebody trespassing via one of the cameras attached to our command van or with all of our computer monitors in the inside that we have connected to all of our other cameras throughout um, Metroland, whatnot, um, once we see somebody trespassing, then we can de deploy our drones, we can track them, um, um, or if we get radioed in of a, of a trespasser from a, um, a passing by train, then we can deploy it. But um, a crime hit still has to occur first before de the deployment of a drone. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> switching back to Croy real quick. You guys discussed your API and the development for alerts. Can you just explain to everybody the API and how they work within you know the technology and what you're doing sure uh, essentially what the api allows us to do it allows any third-party company uh, so for example flow msb 
to ask their system, so whatever software they have, uh, in this case, it's a CAD system that they're using, to reach out and ask our system for data. Uh, so in this case, it'll reach out when there's an alert, let's say in West Chicago, um, it'll ask our system for all relevant West Chicago data, which might be from five sensors. Uh, the data will be sent directly from our end, which is where the API is, to their system, where it can then be processed and displayed to the end user in whatever way they see fit. Okay, excellent. So it's a group, it's the interface that's allowable and usable by third parties and everyone. That's excellent. Yeah, it essentially makes us plug and play with, with most third party companies. Exactly. So Ashley or Dr. Wilson, I think we just have a, another minute or so. Are there any questions that you have for the, the panel or group? I've tried to get through a number of them, but if there was any that interested you greatly, I, I think we can hit yeah. those at the moment. Brian, you've done a great job moderating. Uh, I love the balance as you go back and forth from one person to another. One question that I had for Kevin is with the photokite, does that tethered portion of the kite provide a power source so that it can stay in the air longer? Absolutely. Um, so the current model that we have is we have uh, battery packs that are um, in the back of our van yeah. and it runs off of that or can run off the actual vehicle as long as the uh, keys in the ignition and the key uh, motors being powered. Very so good. we've, we've used it to keep it up there for uh, um, a day or two. Sometimes. Oh, really? Wow. Our, yep. Some of our accident and crime scenes, uh, we've kept it up for a couple of days just to monitor the scene and uh, keep our viewers uh, updated on the status. I know that's one of the problems with drones. The battery life is only, what, less than an hour or something like that for most of them? Or uh, d Depending on the model, it can be really anywhere between 15 minutes to 45 minutes. Okay, sure. Which is nice with this is that we can just keep it up in the air and yeah. bring it up when we need to. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. Thank you to all of our panel members. Really appreciate all of your work on this and thanks and we'll see you later.